The listing paperwork in the state of Indiana falls into like five different buckets of categories. We got the listing agreement. That's one form. It's about six or seven pages. Uh, we got another bucket, which are the disclosures, and there's two different forms for that. It's the property condition report and the lead paint disclosure. Uh, the third bucket is the MLS exemption form. It's a single, it's a one-page form. Uh, the fourth bucket is authoriz authorization to release information. That's one, uh, it's a one-page document. And then five, the fifth bucket is brokerage disclosure. So you got the affiliated business disclosure, an agency policies disclosure, and a wiring fraud disclosure. All right, so to, to go through these is probably going to take 45 minutes in all of them. So it's very helpful to get a heads up in advance of a listing appointment to go through these on a video so you can get familiar with them so that when we're in person filling out paperwork, it will go a lot faster and you'll already have background onto these forms. So, all right, on to the first form, which is the most important one, is the listing agreement. So we're going to jump screens and then we're going to walk through that one line by line. All right, the first form here is the listing contract, the exclusive right to sell. This is the form that gives a brokerage permission to market your house for you and work on your behalf. So we'll just dig right in. So going through this, the first section here is just basic information. It says in consideration of the services to be performed by. So this is where we insert the brokerage name for me with the EXP Realty. So we type that in here. Uh, and then four, and then put the seller's names here. If it's a married couple, it would be both names. If it's a trust, we put the trust information there. Uh, then we go to the property location. So this here would go where the address of the home is. This is the township. And we got county, uh, state, uh, zip code goes here. And legally described as, so this would be the legal description. <clears throat> which would be like lot two of Dorothy's edition three subdivision or something like that. Or otherwise it'll be described as like the north 50 feet from the section line of whatever it is. So then it goes on the contract dates. So the contract begins on a contract start date. So that's when the agreement is effective and then when it would expire or how long the contract goes to. This section lists the list price. All right, so here, this section here is asking to confirm that the seller is not delinquent on any loans, and this and this is asking the seller to attest that they have enough equity in the property to be able to convey it to somebody. Because, like, for example, if you owe $300,000 on a $250,000 house, if somebody, and you sell it for $250,000, you still can't convey the house to them because that would not pay off the existing mortgage on the property. So this is saying that... The next section here is saying that the seller has capacity to convey the property by general warranty deed. And so that means warranty deed is like the highest and best deed. So that means that the new seller would be assured that they'd have no issues with title on the home. Uh, we can get in the details if you have any questions on. Again, any questions as, as we go through this, make a note. Uh, feel free to call me in advance or text me or send me an email or just uh, save them for when we meet together. All right, this section here, did the seller acquire ownership of the property, a tax sale, share of sale, a judicial sale, or mortgage foreclosure proceeding? So if, if you did, you just click yes there. Uh, here is this line 2122, we're just talking about if someone's a foreign per person, you just have to check yes, and if you are not subject to, to the Foreign Investment Real Property Tax Act, so you would just click yes or no. I've never encountered anybody that has not been able to click yes is no and no on that one and you know not good or bad either way but almost always it's uh, yes or it's not it's not all right terms of sale so this is what financing you would accept as a seller so kind of going in order of what's best would be first is obviously cash cash isn't listed on here because that's kind of the obvious one and then it goes conventional mortgage is then second best insured conventional then we got uh, FHA and VA, and then conventional sales contract, conditional sales contract, and assumption of existing mortgage balances. Those are pretty uncommon, very uncommon. And so usually everybody would accept cash, conventional, insured conventional, 
And those are usually the three that are almost always accepted. And then the next category would be VHA or VHA, VHS, v, FHA and VA. And then I've never had anybody that was interested in existing assumption of existing balance or conditional sales contract. That'd be kind of more like on the investment strategy side. All right. So this next section here, it says seller agrees to pay costs associated with financing not to exceed. So we, in general, we just put a line through here uh, only in unique conditions would be volunteer that info to pay for financing in, in advance usually a, a buyer would ask for that if they want the seller to contribute towards that so it's prop uh, next section here 31 to 37 this just talks about everything that's included in the sale so we've got you know leading through here you can read through the details it's basically everything that's fixed like attached to the house would stay unless you are and including window shades here curtain rods draperies fixtures ceiling lights towel racks and bars so basically it's everything that's like connected to the house somehow and then if there's anything that's not oh other things that would be included that may not be obvious you would add here like for example they have smart home device like a nest a nest thermostat that's a real popular one that you would see being included or not included you'd spell that out either way and then here if it excludes anything so like let's say you have an entertainment center that you're taking with you that's like bolted to the wall if anything that's bolted to the wall we would usually assume would be included in the sale so here you would want to list any of that that would be coming with you chandeliers is something i see somewhat somewhat frequent usually this is blank but uh chandeliers is something that's pretty common to see if, there, if there's going to be something there uh, so next section here, seller shall remove all debris and personal property not included in the sale. So it basically means you're going to clear out the house before you go. Uh, 49 through 64 here, these lines here. So this is an exclusive listing. So this is about the terms of the contract. So this states that the seller understands that this is an exclusive agreement with the real estate brokerage working on their behalf and that when the at the end of the, the contract is when the house sells and at the point the house sells then that means that the brokerage would be due their, their commission or fee based on the terms of this contract that the seller broker or real estate licensee secures that the house is that the leasee is ready willing and able to purchase option exchange this is saying that hey at me as the seller i'm saying that i am able to convey this property to the seller or the buyer uh sec item three here and so at the time an agreement is entered into sell exchange option or lease during the term of this contract or any renewal extension of an ultimately completed termination of this contract so this is a saying the terms of the contract so if, the, it's, if this contract is entered into sell, exchange, option, or lease during the term of the contract, so then that would be, so this line is saying that at, at the time that a ready, willing, and able buyer is found that can bring an offer to the terms that the buyer, that the seller agrees to, that that is what triggers a commission being due at the time of sale. Item three and two kind of go together there. So item four here is if the property is sold, option, leased, or exchanged by a seller or any other person within so many days after the termination of this listing contract. So this is saying, like, let's say sometimes sellers for various reasons will do like a 30-day listing. And that's really not a good way to go because the contract process takes longer than that usually if there's conventional financing or financing. So this is saying that, hey, if if this is if the home is listed, say for five days and a buyer is brought in the buyer's agent and the seller's agent negotiate a deal that the buyer and seller both agree to and they put the contract together and then the contract closes say 40 days later that 40 days would be 10 days after this the le the contract term ends so but this is saying that hey because the deal was put together while the listing contract was valid on the contract dates then the commission would be due even though the closing date happens outside of the term of this contract and then item five here states that the commission would also be due at the point where say there's a contract put together buyer seller agrees you're signed off on and then the seller changes their mind 
or decides not to sell at, at that time, then the commission would still be due, which because it's promised to the buyer's agent too, because both agents have done what they said they would, they were contracted to do. And this rarely ever, I've never encountered this happening either, but that's just a catch all language in the contract for when commissions would be due. Line 67 through 71 is saying that the commission would be due at the time of closing. And if for some reason it wasn't paid at that time, then there would be an interest due on the commission based on a rate of whatever is here. And we always just leave that blank because commissions get paid at closing. This line here is a little bit of a repeat above. This just states that if a contract is put together during the term of when this contract is signed, again, you know, say it's a one month listing and then it closes 45 days later, which is outside of the term of the listing calendar, then the commission would still be due because this, this clause is extending the validity dates of the contract until the date of closing. 77 through 80 here, this is talking about broker's commission. This is basically saying that the broker's commission is set by the broker and not by the state. And 82 and so on says seller shall pay in cash US dollars to broker for services, a total commission as so this is how much the commission rate would be. And so usually just fill in here the percentage, basically the commission is based off of a percentage of the, the sale price. And then in the event, event of a purchase option, the seller agrees to compensate and I, we usually leave these blank on ours because uh, most sellers aren't interested in going down the path of a purchase option. Uh, lease two, uh, we usually leave this blank because this is saying that in event of a lease, so this would be like, all right, the seller intends to sell the property, but then for whatever reason during the contract decides to lease it, then this would, this states that the seller would agree to compensate the briar, the, the broker, whatever percent was listed here of the lease amount. And again, that's how I've never encountered that happening for, on a sale, you know, on, on rentals, that's different. All right. And then other, if there was some other term of how commission was to be paid, but usually it's just item one's filled in and that's how commission is set. All right. This 93 through 95 talks about the, this just states that the commission amount, so whatever the commission amount is set, that's the total amount the seller would pay. And that gets paid to the buyer agents and the seller's agents, so their the brokerages. So whatever, you know, if it's 6%, you just pick a number, then some of that 6% goes to the buyer's brokerage and some of that 6% goes to the seller's brokerage and together that makes up the 6%. So all right, commission attorney's fees. This states here that if for some reason there is a legal action that comes out of this, that basically the person who doesn't win the legal action would be paying for the winner side of the, of the legal action. And I've never encountered anything going to uh, adjudication, but that's what this is for here. All right. Earnest money is talking about that the, you know, so once the offer is accepted, then the buyer has to submit earnest money. And this says that the broker is allowed to hold, accept the earnest money and put it in an escrow account until the closing happens. And that the, the broker could use that commission amount to pay towards the, the, yeah, so these funds could be, so again, the buyer is going to submit earnest money that's going to get held by the brokerage. And then the brokerage could use that earnest money check that they received held in their escrow account to pay their, the real estate agent out of that funds. So it would be, it would be no additional money or anything. It just makes the bookkeeping easier because what happens is that there is, you know, again, the, the listing agent's brokerage in this case or attorney would be holding their earnest money. And instead of them giving the, sending the money to the title company for closing to then just get a check back that they, for to pay for their commission, that they would just take, hold that money until closing and then use that towards the listing agent's uh, commission. It's more just a bookkeeping exercise to make things easier. All right. Listing service 106 to 111. Uh, this talks about, yeah, this section talks about that 
the brokerage, you know, the broker like, you know, say I'm working with you to help you sell your house, that we would list the house on the multiple listing service. And that is, that's what you want to do because that gets us the most exposure. That just give that just as in, as having the seller signing off that they understand that the house information and other stats about the house is going to be entered into the MLS, which is the multiple listing service, to be disseminated out to all the different outlets like Zillow, Redfin, Realtor, Homes.com, so on and so forth. All right, F here, item information regarding property. This section is just the seller acknowledging that they do have ownership in the house and the property and they are able to convey their interest to a buyer that there's nothing holding up that process from happening and that there isn't another listing contract already on the on the property and this is an indemnification of the brokerage representing the seller for anything about the house so or the property such that you know the brokerage is just their role is a is assisting with the sale of the property and that they are not responsible for the condition or any issues with the property. All right, item paragraph G here, 125 through 137. You get environmental contaminant, contaminants advisor. So this is the seller just agreeing that they're acknowledging that the broker is not a expert at any of this environmental stuff like lead-based paint, radon, mold, other contaminants and that the seller will consult with experts to get opinions or guidance on such items, which is basically this section here. All right, agency disclosures, and again, there'll be more forms for that at the end that will spell this out more. But the first one is office poly policy, and this just states that the seller acknowledges that each brokerage has office policies that might be a little bit different and that you have received a copy of the written office policy relating to that brokerage of which there'll be another form for that agency relationship and again there's other the other forms kind of include this language but this states that the it's some kind of obvious that the seller has a real agency relationship with the broker that's working with them because uh, what's actually interesting is that the, the listing agreement is held between the seller and the brokerage itself so I, like i'm with exp realty so the agreement is between the seller exp realty but i'm the designated agent working on working with the seller so in this case this is saying that i would have a relationship with the seller i'm the one working with the seller and that the, the other stuff here states that i owe the duty of confidentiality of fiduciary responsibility account yeah trust loyal confidentiality accounting and disclosure to the seller it also states, however, I also, or the, the selling agent, has to deal honestly with the buyer and to disclose any information about the property. And again, that's about the property, but not anything beyond that. Like if the seller is in a hurry to sell due to some sort of medical bills issue or anything like that, that we are not, we will don't say anything about that. We're not allowed to. We wouldn't want to. But we, anything that we know about the house, we have to disclose about the about the house to the buyer. That's what this section states. All right, limited agency authorization. Yeah, this repeats a little bit. It's a little different. So limited agency authorization. This would be like if a so, so I'm helping you sell your house. I'm the your 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 yourself. I was called the seller's agent, and then somebody calls me off a yard sign and wants to know about the house or or go on a tour of the house and then you know write an offer on the property and so in that situation it's called limited agency where you know i'm directly contracted by the seller to sell their house and then the buyer i'm assisting them with the buying side of it so that would be limited agency and so again this kind of repeats a little bit before but it states that you know i have the, I have the responsibility of being honest and disclosing facts to both sides but it'd be nothing that would give an upper hand to either person in a negotiation so if the if, if i knew something about the property of which is all in the disclosures anyway that the disclosures will get to because there's a form that states like you know does the foundation have issues and so anything like that that i know of i would have to disclose to a buyer because that is stuff that needs to be you know open book on but anything that is beyond that like seller's motivation to sell of which we'll get down to here so these things that would not be disclosed like any material confidential information that i know about the property to that would be dis disclosed that 
Yeah, so anything that this is stating here that anything about the property that wouldn't be obvious in an inspection, like let's say there was a finished wall, but there is a big crack behind it, then the, the you know the seller's agent would be obligated to disclose that if it's something that wouldn't be picked up in an inspection. But things that would not be disclosed would be such that things like that the buyer would pay more than the offering price. This would be like negotiation strategies. Like if I knew that the seller, they're really, they're bottom, you know, they got on the market for 400,000, but they really take 380, that I would not tell the buyer that. And if I knew the buyer would go up to 420, I would not tell the seller that. So it's confidentiality on both sides. Uh, you know, you can help with strategies for, e for each side, but you wouldn't tell any like secrets to the other side. Uh, again, this is a repeat of that, that you wouldn't, yeah, yeah, we already covered that one. And yeah, this is a repeat too, the other terms that would create a contractual advantage for one party over another, and what motivates a party to buy or sell the property. So sometimes in a strategy, this, the buyer or seller may want the other person to know that, but in general, you would not disclose that without uh, without approval from the buyer or seller. Uh, this is kind of a repeat of that. All right, moving down. Yeah, this just states that, again, the seller acknowledges that that the real estate agent could be help the buyer and seller on both sides. All right, seller authorization and cooperation. So this state, a lot of this is going to be very obvious, but it has to be in there, I guess. So it states that the seller agrees to provide broker with the required information so that we can execute a proper listing and you know stuff information about that we that the seller gives the agent permission to share photos um, other information about the property that the seller will cooperate with providing access to the property for showings here this talks about the seller will cooperate with any other parties that may need to be involved such as photographers inspectors contractors uh, item two here is that the seller provide broker with keys to access or other access necessary for the property. Three, a seller authorizes broker to have duplicate keys made. Uh, yeah, that's that's infrequent. Usually the seller will provide, uh, just for security, will provide a, a set of keys. Uh, nobody really makes duplicates, but that's just in there. Uh, four, seller agrees to not rent or lease the property during the term of this written contract. Yeah, so that means that the the, bot, the seller will not make another contract for the property that would uh, f interfere with this listing contract five states that the seller agrees that the broker may work with buyers brokers to assist and yeah so this means that you know me working for you as your agent i may have buyer brokers that assist like you know to help with the showing or something like that so there may be others involved in the property helping me out all right six here seller grants to yeah so here we go a little, little wordy here yeah, this states here that the seller is granting to the broker the rights to photos and anything that they need to produce to put together a, a good listing marketing package. So like photos, information about the house, drawings, all that good stuff. You're saying that the uh, the seller will allow the, the, the broker to use this information that they generate. All right, seven. Seller authorizes its utilities companies to divulge utility information. And usually we don't fill this out. We would, the seller would just provide this information, uh, such as if some, you know, lot, sometimes buyers will ask how much utilities are and we'll just get information from the, the seller at that time. All right. Number eight, seller authorizes its, its homeowners associations to divulge information. So this would be where we list the HOA contacts, uh, how much the fees are. All right, nine. This says the seller authorizes lending institution to divulge mortgage information. And there we have another form on that, that the title company, the title company actually does that for us in Illinois and Indiana. Uh, but this would be if the, you know, where you put in the, the lender's name and mortgage number. And again, we don't fill this out because there's a different form. So the title company can do that for us. All right, the seller, item 10 here, seller does or does not authorize broker to disclose the existence of written offers. And what I always do is I would have, 
my recommendation is to click does but then i would touch base with the seller at that time because there's different strategies at, at that i mean that's a whole nother conversation but there's different strategies so i would just recommend clicking yes here and then we take that on a case-by-case -case basis uh, 11 seller is or is not offering a limited home warranty and that's another conversation but that's just what the item on the form here uh, J is lockbox key authorization. So this states that the seller will make their house safe. I, you know, they don't want, won't, leave, won't leave valuables out. That the broker is not responsible for anything that maybe get lost or damaged during showings. And that the seller instructs broker to make reasonable efforts to notify seller of showing requests, which is, which is obvious. You know, you'd be notified. It's another conversation about how the showing process works. And if the seller can't be contacted to schedule showing that the seller authorizes or does not authorize the broker to access the property. So like let's say uh, and, and we're helping you sell your home and you guys are on vacation and you're and I know you're on vacation and you're sell, you don't have sell service, that this would authorize me to run over to your house and do a showing to uh, provide access to somebody who's interested in seeing it. So, all right, the four is where a tenant leases the property, the seller's responsibility to return obtain tenant consent so this is a saying that the seller will help with getting a tenant's approval to uh, tour to have buyers tour the home all right paragraph k recording at the property so this is twofold this is buyer side and seller side so this is the seller notifying the seller that if you have a home recording if you have a home recording system and you, that's recording while showings are on. There are certain legal things you can or cannot do with that footage because it's uh, in the privacy of a home, such as the, the seller acknowledging that they understand that and that this is stating that the, the buyers are allowed to take photos or videos while they're in the home and just so the seller's acknowledging that. Fair housing, this is kind of a big one nowadays. Not that it's an issue with sellers, but just in the industry is that fair housing it states that uh, no party, seller, buyer can discriminate against the other because of race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familiar status, and disability. Uh, there's a new one coming to on source of income. And yes, and this one here, this is kind of a new thing too, is that due to fair housing risks, buy, broker will not prepare, review, or submit personal information letters, including photographs from buyer to seller. And so what this is, they have these things called like love letters where a buyer in their offer may submit to a seller you know reasons why they won't and why they they should be picked for their house um, and as usually this comes up during competitive markets where there's multiple offers where a buyer may try to get on a seller's soft side about stating you know their unique needs or why they really need to be in the area or, or what have you and so this just states that the brokers will not get involved in that because that can very quickly go into the category of rate, you know, of these fair housing uh, categories. So that's just saying that, you know, I feel like I've had it happen where a buyer's agent will submit an offer and say, attached is a letter that my buyer wanted me to submit. I have not looked at it. And so that's his way of like of wiping his hands from that issue, but still conveying the information. And now uh, we can cover this. Uh, it's already. All right. So uh, item M, additional provisions. So we're, we're, almost, we're, almost, we're almost done with this one, guys. All right. Additional provisions. One, seller understands the terms of this listing contract and has received a copy. Parties of this contract agree that it contains entire agreement and cannot be changed except by their written ex extent. It's pretty obvious. It's like, hey, this is the paperwork. And if there's going to be any changes, then there that would be done through a addendum process. And item three, parties of this contract agree that it's binding on their heirs, administrators, executives, successors, it's assigns. So if you, you know, it's kind of obvious, but you have this listing contract and then you will your property to somebody else that the contract would stay stay valid and usually if that were to happen you would just work on canceling this contract but that's just the legal ease that's in here item four this is talking about how in the buying and selling process there's lots of paperwork that has to be signed and that two partial signatures can combine one so like let's say 
you sign something and then you need somebody like a wife to sign something else, you know, if they both sign an original, then those two originals together will make up both their signatures. So I'm not just saying that you can piecemeal items until you have collected all the signatures you need to fully execute a document. And here, broker may refuse seller to other professional service or refer. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so this is saying that the, you know, like me, if I was working with you and you needed somebody to fix a deck or something like that or provide title services that I could offer a referral, but ultimately that I'm not responsible for them. And, you know, there's, there's always, there's many different vendors that are involved in uh, buying a sale process. So, uh, yeah, so that, that does happen a lot. Item six is stating that the selling agent is not responsible for taking care of the property during the marketing period. So that's like, you know, cutting grass or if something happens to the house that it's not the broker's responsibility to cut the grass or fix the house. Again, another obvious item, but there's, uh, the legalese has to be in here. Uh, seller can, this is item seven, it's just, states that communication all counts as telephone, U.S. mail, email, text message, and facsimile, you know, unless you didn't want one of those sources of communication. And that, all right, eight, uh, getting the weeds here, saying that where a broker appears, it shall mean licensee. And that is sometimes the jargon does get confusing because there's realtors, real estate agents, brokers, brokerages, and so these three kind of all are the same thing nowadays. The state of Indiana went away with salesperson, and so everybody's a broker. But broker also is known as, like, what company you're with, like, what's your brokerage. And so sometimes those get confusing. But licensee was basically the real estate agent or realtor, which is also called broker in Indiana. Uh, all right, nine. Seller discloses to listing broker that seller is licensed and holds license numbers. This would be if the seller has a real estate license, they, they would just put that in here. All right, wiring fraud. There's another wiring fraud form uh, that we'll see later on. And this states that wiring fraud is bad. Be careful with it. And don't trust really anything you receive via email that has wiring instructions on it. All right, further conditions. This would be if you, if there's other conditions to this contract. Um, and for example, I've had one where a, a seller wanted to sell their house, but they had a friend that was interested in it. So they just wrote in here, like, commission would not be due if Bob and Sally Smith buy the property. And so, you know, anything that would be unique to the, the contract here. And then just signatures here. So this is the agent, the, broker and then the managing broker seller signatures and that's it for the the listing agreement paperwork all right so the next one we're going to move on to are the disclosures all right we got through item one listing agreement that's the biggest one so the rest should be a lot easier and faster so two we are in the disclosures we got the property condition and the lead-based paint disclosure so i will fill those up on the screen now all right, so here is the seller's residential real sales disclosure. And so, yeah, this fills out. It just gets dated here. Property address goes here. Uh, following our, and so we just, this will be, let's get straight into it. These are just the different items of the house. So this states that, this is to the best, this language here, it states like, to the best of the seller's knowledge that the below is true is what this is stating here. Uh, item one, the following are in the conditions indicated. So that's a precursor to all the rest of this stuff. So we'll just dig right into it. So here we got the statuses of different, of these different items are either it's not included or there isn't one, which is kind of the same thing, or if it's rented, and we'll get into that in a minute, but rented is very seldom except basically for uh, water softeners. All right, so then we got defective, not defective, and do not know would be the categories. So for each of these items, built-in vacuum system, is it, is there one not included? That's 90, I've had one house that had one actually so far, <laughs> but everything else is usually no. And then if it doesn't work, you put defective. If it's not defective, that means it's fine. Instead of saying, you know, instead of saying it works, it's just saying not defective. And again, this is to the best of your knowledge, because sometimes they'd be like, yeah, they've, there's one here, but I've never used it. So that one you would, that one you could put do not know. But if you used it once 
and it worked last time last year, then you could write not defective. All right, then we'll just, so that's kind of how the categories works. Then we'll just go into what each of these are, and I'll just give definitions because they're not language you use every day. All right, clothes dryer, that one's self-explanatory. Clothes washer, you know where you wash your clothes. Dishwasher, you know, kitchen dishwashers. Disposal, you know, garbage disposal that's, on, you know, mounted in the sink that grinds up, like, you know, vegetable waste and stuff like that. Uh, yes, yeah, disposal. Freezer, so this would be like if you have a, a you know, most people have a, combine refrigerator freezer that would be in the refrigerator bucket so this freezer would be like if there's a chest freezer that's included or if you've got you know like sub-zero not standalone refrigerator and then a separate freezer that would be like what the freezer is a uh, gas grill usually those aren't included uh sometimes they are you know hard piped in the ground so that would be that a hood if there's a you know a venting hood Microwave oven, sometimes those aren't even included, most of the time they are. Oven, you know, where you would cook a turkey, and then range is where, you know, boil water. And most of the time, the oven range are one item. Uh, sometimes they are separate, so it's kind of, while well, they're listed separate. Uh, refrigerator, you know, that's most, traditionally, that's most people's combined refrigerator freezer. Uh, room air conditioners, so that's if you have a, a you know, like a portable air conditioner in the window units for, for the most part there's other type of room air conditioners but that's usually what they are trash compactor that's very rare the houses have those some do on a tv antenna dish i find a lot that people will if they have one usually it's like they used to it they used to use it they don't know if it works anymore so then you, you know for that one you just write you know do not know and then other if there's other items you want to list usually uh, there's not more you would add all right just going down the system and again, our rankings are, again, either non or not included, uh, defective, not defective, or don't know. So air purifier, if you have an air purifier in the house, burglar alarm, ceiling fans, garage door openers and the controllers, like the clickers, inside telephone wiring and blocks and jacks. You know, there's nowadays hardly anybody knows if those work. So most people click do not know for that one. Uh, intercom, light fixtures, the sauna, smoke fire alarms, switches and outlets, vent fans uh the the service to your house which one is it you just circle 60 100 200 or other and uh, if there's a generator you know is that does that work or not or they would say defective or not defective all right going to the other column here we got uh this is a fun one most people are like what's this so we got a cistern you know so cisterns were usually older school ways of collecting rainwater and then you'd reuse it for various items uh actually in uh, stegger illinois there's still a lot of houses that have cisterns and they're like huge they're like you know in the basement there'll be like these like eight foot diameter tanks that you know you would collect rainwater yeah, it's pretty wild to see uh you got septic field or bed like my house has septic uh hot tub plumbing aerator system if you have an aerator uh, sump pumps, irrigation systems, hot water heater, if it's electric. So if you have a gas hot water heater, then you just put, you know, none. Uh, here's hot water heater gas. You got hot, weeder, hot water heater solar. That's very uncommon. A water purifier, water softener. And again, water softeners are sometimes rented. So that would be one that I see sometimes as rented. I don't think any of these other items I've seen as rented. But sometimes people, you know, rent furniture. So that would just be, you know, some of these items may be rented. Uh, but water softener is the one item that I do see sometimes clicked here because it's rented and not included. Uh, well, septic and holding tank, geothermal and heat pump, other sewer system. There's, because sometimes there's unique situations to how sewer systems work. Swimming pool and pool equipment. Okay, all right, moving on here. The questions are... Are the structures connected to a public water system? So that'd be like, you know, if you lived in the town of Dyer or any other town really, and you know, you live in a typical subdivision, then most likely you're getting the water from a public water system. Uh, sometimes like in Cedar Lake, there's community wells. Um, so that'd be a little different. Uh, next question, are structures connected to a public sewer system? You know, if you're in a standard subdivision, 99% of the time, it's, the answer is yes. Sometimes there's some nuances to it. Uh, next question, are there any additions that may require improvements to the sewage disposal system? And so if, you know, if anything needs to be done, you just click yes. And then there's a spot to answer, give more information later on here. All right, well, are the improvements connected to a private community water system? 
and that's what it is. You would click yes here. Are there the improvements connected to a private community sewer system? You click no here. So obviously if you're connected to a public water system or sewer system, then you would not be on a private community or, or private or community water or sewer system. One thing that's kind of interesting is uh, there's some, so some houses in Cedar Lake where they are on their own well. So each house has their own well, but they're on a community sewer system. Like the sewer, it's a public sewer system. So that's kind of interesting. All right, heating and cooling system. So attic fan. And again, we're just, you would categorize it none or not included or rented or defective, not defective, do not know. Attic fan, central air conditioning, hot water heater, furnace heat, which would be gas, or furnace heat electric, solar house heating, a wood burning stove if you have one, fireplace, fireplace insert, air cleaner, humidifier, propane tank, or other heating source. So then what happens is the sellers would sign both sides of these. And what's interesting, I'll get, repeat this later down here, but so the sellers sign it at the time of listing the house and then the buyers would sign it when they submit their offer. But then at the closing table, you know, cause that's usually 30 days ish later or something, then each side signs it again to attest that nothing has changed from the time that the house was under contract in Illinois, that there isn't this process, but I find that is interesting. All right, so going on to page two, which is more about the roof. Age, if known, does the roof leak? Yes, no, do not know. Is there present damage to the roof? Yeah, and, the, and again, the categories have changed. You just got to watch out because it's a little different. So yes, no, or do not know, or is the rankings here? Is there present damage to the roof? Okay, is there more than one layer of shingles on the house? Uh, so sometimes houses are re-roofed and they just put a layer of shingles over it. I've seen as many as three layers on a roof. Uh, if yes, how many layers? All right, hazardous conditions, and this states that have there been any, any, has there been or are there any hazardous conditions on the property, such as methane, gas, lead paint, radon gas, radioactive material, landfill, mine shaft, expensive soils, toxic soils, other items, PCBs. So yes, no, do not know. Are there any, there was some law that came out where this is a question on every property, I think in the U.S., but it's asking about is there a contamination caused by manufacturer of consult substance that has not been cert you know certified as decontaminated and then oh I think this one was what i was thinking of is there has been manufacturer of meta <laughs> never say that word methamphetamine there we go or dumping waste from the manufacturer of methamphetamine in a residential structure on the property all right so that'd be yes no do not know and again any explanations that you have here or it could be from page one would go here all right, other disclosures. So do the structures have aluminum wiring? And again, these are now the categories yes, no, or do not know. Because this is just, you have to disclose this information. It's not, it doesn't work or is it, you know, is it broken or not? Just that, you know, some people may not want a house with aluminum wiring. So, uh, or they may, might just need to include budget to replace it to copper. All right, so the, the, again, these questions are, are there any foundation problems with the structures? Are there any encroachments? So encroachments would mean like if your garage was built over your neighbor's property line or vice versa, uh, that would just be something that the buyer would need to know that there might be some sort of ownership issue or legal issue to handle. Are there any violations of zoning, building codes, or restrictive covenants? So if you know if you got violation of you know whatever it could be, just yes, no, or do not know. Is the present use of non-conforming use? So this is it's pretty uncommon too, but this would be like if you're if you have a garage that's bigger than what is allowed, but you have it was you know it was approved through some process, you would just disclose that. Like for example, my neighbor has this he built a two thousand square foot addition to his garage, and that was like non-conforming use. So he had to go through a process of getting the neighborhood to sign off on him being okay with it. And the garage is really cool. <laughs> All right, is the access to your property via a private road? Uh, that's usually uncommon. Sometimes the answer is yes. Is the access to your property via a public road? Has the access to your property via an easement? And again, these are just yes, no, or do not know. Have you received any notices by an intergovernmental or quasi-governmental agency affecting this property? So yes, no. Are there any structural problems with this building? Have any substantial additions or alterations been made without requiring a building permit, without a required building permit? Are there moisture and or water problems in the basement, crawl space, or any other area? Is there any damage 
due to wind, flood, termites, or rodents? Have any structures been treated for wood, destroying insects? Are the furnace, wood stove, chimney, flue all in working order? Is the property in a floodplain? Do you currently pay for flood insurance? Does the property contain underground storage tanks? Is the homeowner a licensed real estate salesperson? Is there any threatened or ex existing litigation regarding the property? Is the property subject to covenants, conditions, and or restrictions of a homeowner's association? Yeah, and so this would be if it's in a uh, HOA, then that would be yes. And yeah, it's not a good or bad thing. It's just letting the buyer know um, any any restrictions that are on the house. And is the property located within one mile of an airport? All right, so that completes the property disclosure. And then the sellers, again, they'd sign this page too. And buyers would sign when they submit an offer. And then at closing, both sides sign again. All right, that concludes the property disclosure. And we're going to move on to the lead-based paint disclosure. All right, here is the lead-based paint disclosure. Uh, compared to the last two, this will be really fast. Uh, so this goes through here. The property address goes here. And this states that oh, lead-based paint, this disclosure is only required on homes built prior to 1978. And it's just saying here that lead poison, and then the reason for this form is that houses before 78 has potential for lead, and lead can cause all these different items, and so this needs to be disclosed to the buyer. So here is where the disclosures are, is that this states that the presence of lead-based paint and or lead-based paint hazards, so this states that, hey, are there known lead-based paint and or lead-based hazards in the in the house? If so, explain, like if you know that lead paint is in part of the house or, you know, in the garage or something. Or, then this is 99% of the time what I what see sellers selecting is seller has no knowledge of lead-based paint and or lead-based paint hazards in the house, in the housing. Uh, B, this state's kind of similar to this one, is about documentation. So this is saying that if you do have documentation about lead on the property, that you would check that here. Yeah, so if you have information about lead being in a certain part of the house, then you would attach that information here. And again, 99% of the time, uh, the sellers click here where they don't have any records about lead-based paint in the house. Where, where you see this sometimes that there's information is on a house or property that was like, that was foreclosed on or um, was a government, you know, taken over by the government and then sold a surplus property or something, then they would have documentation on that that you might uh, convey after fixing it up and selling. All right, so this, that, this part up here is what the seller signs off on. And then the buyer here, when they submit an offer, they would then fill this out saying that the buyer has received copies of all information listed above. And even if there isn't any information, you know, if you don't have any records, they would still sign off on that. The buyer has received the pamphlet, Protect Your Family from Lead in Your Home, and that's just the standard for, uh, form that's available on the web. Um, so then the buyer's agent would give them a copy of that, and we attach it to the listing too so they have it. Uh, 34, buyer has, you check one or two here, they re either receive the 10-day opportunity or a mutually agreed upon period of time to conduct a risk assessment for the presence of lead and our lead best paint materials, or if you waive the opportunity to conduct a risk assessment, and this is 99% of the time of what gets checked by the buyers. So they would check here, 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 and here in general. You know, if they need due diligence for a lead inspection or something, then they would click this one. All right, broker's acknowledgement. So this would be like where I, as you know, as the listing broker would sign here, say that I've informed the seller of obligations under the Real Estate Lead-Based Paint Reduction Act. All right, certificate of accuracy. This just states that you, everyone's filled this out to the best of their knowledge, and it's true. And again, this gets into that language. It's kind of on the listing agreement that states that, you know, like let's say the, the seller signs this document, and then it, that's printed, and then the buyer signs a different document then, or maybe they have a blank one that has the same information on it, and they sign that one, that you put the two together, and that makes one fully executed one and then the seller signs off here seller sign seller sign uh listing brokers so that'd be like me in this situation representing the buyer or the seller sorry <laughs> and then on the buyer side the buyer one buyer two so like you know husband and wife and then the sellers the, the buyer's agents would sign there so that concludes the lead-based paint certification 
All right, so now we're on to bucket number three, which is another just one page form, which is the MLS exemption. Let's jump right into that one. All right, so the purpose of this forum, the MLS of Gnire, which is Greater Northwest Indiana Association of Realtors, that's going to be changed soon to NIR, Northwest Indiana Association of Realtors. So what the purpose of this form is that there's an Indiana legal requirement that within 72 hours of filling out contract paperwork, listing paperwork, that the listing then has to be into the MLS, so that it then has to be, you know, on all the different websites and whatnot. So what happens a lot is that when a time we fill out paperwork, that there is still stuff in the house that needs to be completed before we want to actually advertise the house, you know, like painting or touch-ups or contractors doing what have you. So what this form does is that it gives a, a time extension to put the house on the market because, again, it's, it's basically just because of the state requirement that the listing has to be advertised within 72 hours. So this gives, this form provides the option to not submit it within 72 hours and then when it would have to be submitted, it will be explained further down in, the, in this form here. So anyway, I just wanted to go through what the spirit of this form is. And again, this isn't, doesn't always apply. You know, sometimes at the time we sign paperwork, it's, you know, when the house is ready to go and ready to be, to be marketed. But again, about half the time or so, it, it needs, you know, another week or so from the time you fill out paperwork to when it actually goes on the market. So, all right. So just going through this, MLS Ignire. So this is acknowledgement, date it, you know, put the date here regarding the property, just, you know, the address of the home, the common address, and then the, uh, seller names would go here and then the listing managing broker you know the broker names goes here and this is the same date as in the marketing or the, the, the ever, listing agreement yes it'd be the same day as the uh, listing agreements gonna think of that word for a second so what this form states is that you know as a as the listing agent I am in the, in the MLS of Ganire and that's we would submit the listing to the MLS so that we can advertise the listing to all the various outlets. And so that's kind of obvious. That's already stated in the listing agreement. Uh, two, mandatory submission. I kind of covered that at the beginning of this is that as the, 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 the law is, is that we have to submit, agents have to submit the listings to the MLS within 72 hours and we're filling this out because we need more than 72 hours to get it into the MLS. All right, three, office exclusive listings. Yeah, so there, what this is is another way of marketing a house is that if sometimes sellers don't want their house to be advertised everywhere, you know, on the different outlets. So what this would be is this would have the home be advertised just on the MLS so only agents would see it. And so it wouldn't go out to like Zillow, Redfin, Homes.com, you know, all those different outlets. It would just be in the MLS, only available for realtors to view. And sometimes this happens where, you know, say the market's really hot and sellers know that they're going to get the price they want for the house with no problem. Then you would market this as an agent. I would market it as a private listing in the MLS so that agents would know that it's not going to be advertised everywhere and then it, it just keeps the little less craziness on showings and what have you. So again, those that's kind of the exception to the rule of how things usually go. All right, so um, four, no additional fees. This talks about that there's no additional costs charged by the MLS replacing a listing in the MLS. That's one of those line items. I'm not sure why it's in here but they, for some reason they felt they need to be in there. All right, so five just talks about the impact of exclusion from the MLS. So obviously a big part of why people sell their house with realtors is to get the house exposed to all the different outlets, you know, to the, the Zillows, the Redfins, all that stuff, to use the showing time, the showing systems, all the, you know, all the things that realtors do, and a lot of it centers around the MLS. So this is just stating that, yeah, you know, the seller acknowledges that, from excluding it, the house from the MLS. And again, we use this just to extend the days before we put it on the MLS, not to like not put on the MLS at all. But stating that, you know, with, without putting the MLS, then other agents may not know about it, so they won't be able to market it to their buyers. That information about the owner's property will not be transmitted by MLS to various internet sites. So again, we already covered that. And that 
brokers and subscribers of MLS will be unaware of the terms and conditions of which the owner is marketing the property. So again, that's kind of all obvious, but that's what I explain what the form is about. And then f fair housing, this just states that even though we're, you would be, if you want to go the route of excluding the house from the MLS, and again, we're just using it for a few days extension, but this would be, this line's talking about if you don't want to use the MLS at all, that if you don't use the MLS at all, that that does not exclude you from not discriminating on the familiar, you know, these different, the protected classes of race, color, origin, national origin, sex, interest, age, marital status, physical, you know, so there's a bunch of different classes here. So, you know, so if you don't advertise on the MLS, you still have to abide by these, uh, by these categories here. And then, so you would sign this here and sign that there. And again, we use this just to extend it for a, a number of days. And we just write on here, like, hey, the house will be submitted to MLS once seller gives direction. And then that puts a expectation as to when the home would be in, on the market. Or sometimes we just write a certain date. So again, just wanted to go over what this form is. So there's background at the time of selling. All right, so now we're on to like bucket four of different documents and this would be it's a, a two page form one page form uh, authorization to release information and some of this was covered on the listing agreement uh, but this is uh, from the title company directly and we'll get in that form right now all right so this form here you'll see is actually one from barrister title i do a lot of work with barrister title for closings in indiana uh, there's different uh, there's community title there's chicago title there's different ones so the forms will be pretty similar so what this does is that the one of the services that the title company does is they do the research on everything that's owed on the house and so that they can prepare mortgage close off paperwork. And so what this does is that this, uh, the seller would fill this out. Uh, we would so let's go through it. The, the spirit of this one is that a seller fills this out, which gives barrister title or whatever title company it is the authority to request payoff statements basically and coordinate payoff with the with the mortgage company directly and it's obviously something you want because at closing you need your mortgage to be paid off so i uh, here would be file number which is something specific to the title company closing date uh, which would we would have that from the contract paperwork good through date we just add a conservative amount of time you know we'd put it like good for like four months or something like that uh, this is just this is barrister's number here so lender this would be like whoever it is if it's like chase bank uh the phone number the fax number of contact for that the name this is the name that the loan is in so you know steve and sally smith loan number you enter the loan number property address and this just states pretty self-explanatory here but i we have given barrister title authority to contact you with issues that arise regarding the payoff of the subject loan we authorize you to provide any and all information that barrister title needs to when needed to ensure that the lo subject loan is paid in a full and timely manner. Uh, two, if for some reason a wire is returned to barrister, we authorize you to release all information relative to the return of any and all wire transfer funds. Uh, three, should the payoff be short, you're authorized to subtract the shortage from our retainage escrow balance. Uh, four, a copy of this authorization may be accepted as an original. And then, so the this says mortgager, so basically it means whoever has the loan. Uh, which is basically the buyer and seller 99% of the time. They write their name here, the last four of their social, and their the date. And then we give this to the title company, which in this case would be Barrister, and then they work with the lender to arrange for payoff statements. So, all right, so that is the authorization to release information form. All right, we're on the home stretch now. We're in the fifth bucket of, of paperwork. And here we have the brokerage disclosures. And so every brokerage has their own disclosures, which are ours are affiliated business, agents policies, and wiring fraud. And pretty much all brokerages have these same ones. Their language might be slightly different, but we will dive right into them. All right, this brokerage disclosure one is the first one of three is this affiliated business arrangement. And this one's a pretty quick one to go through. What this test states is that EXP Realty, which is the brokerage I am with, owns other companies and included in that is IntroLend First Cloud, Silverline Title and Escrow, and then also not broken out here specifically, but in the language here is our 
warranty company, America's Preferred Home Warranty. And this one actually EXP does not own or is not a sister company with. It just has a business relationship with. And so what this is just stating is that that you know EXP either owns or has a business relationship with those different entities. So EXP may financially benefit if you chose to do business with any of these uh, companies. IntroLend First Cloud, I really have never worked with them. Silverline Title and Escrow, I have not worked with them either. Uh, with America's Preferred Home Warranty, that is the vendor that we rec recommend for warranties. There's other options too, and just the reason we recommend is because we have a business partnership with America's Preferred Home Warranty. They're very responsive to us. They they really like working with EXP. So that's why we work we work with them and why we re recommend using them. And again, there's other there's other warranty companies, other title companies, mortgage companies that are out there. Uh, but again, just as a legal requirement to disclose that there is business relationships. So this the signatures go here and here. Uh, seller one, seller one, seller two, and that is the affiliated business arrangement form. All right. This, Disclosure, brokerage disclosure number two is agency office policies. And so this, this is a lot of content that's very similar to what the listing agreement states. But this states that there is a working relationship between uh, me as your agent and yourself, which is kind of obvious, you know, you'd want there to be. And then also states that some of the responsibilities are be available to receive timely and present offers and counter offers. So that just means I'll be responsive to working with you and, and your needs and your timelines. Because in Indiana, contracts do have expiration dates. So like offers will have a date where it expires. And so we need to respond to that before then, you know, things of that nature. And then, and then this just goes into more of the same that, you know, there's different milestones of a contract and that we are obligated to be responsive and meet those deadlines and work with you to make that happen. Uh, second section here is limited agency representation. Yeah, and this language just uh, mirrors what was in the listing agreement, which basically states that, you know, me as your listing agent, my primary responsibility is with you and helping you sell your house, keeping confidentiality. Uh, but that if a buyer were to call me to ask to see the house and want to submit an offer, that I could work with them, but that that would not divulge information to the buyer that would give an unfair advantage or vice versa. I you could give guidance on both sides to make the deal come together. But anything, this is like specific to examples like, you know, the seller's got some sort of situation where they need to sell right away and they'll take any offer that comes. You know, that would be something I would not, that would be good for me to know representing you, but I would not say that to the buyer. You know, we could encourage them to write an offer. And, you know, if like a buyer was on the fence, they could be like, oh, please, you know, submit. I know the buyer's entertaining offers, you know, but you wouldn't say that they're desperate or anything like that. You could, you could say what you needed to, to kind of keep the, the deals going and trying to get the best deal. You know, again, my fiduciary responsibility is up first to the seller. And then on the buyer's side, it would just be helping them facilitate the, the, the transaction. So that's what limited agency represents. So limited agency also is called dual agency, which means that the agent would be working with both the buyer and the seller. All right. So when representing buyers, this will be a little bit of a repeat language. Yeah, this basically states that, you know, say I was working for a buyer, that it would allow me to show the buyer properties and other properties. So let's say... Somebody called me from a yard sign for selling, you know, Bob's house. Bob's hired me to be their agent to sell their house. And Steve calls me from a yard, my yard sign in Bob's house. And he wants to see this house. And he says, hey, it's not for me. I want to see another house. So this just states that I would be able to help him find a different house if the primary house was not of, of his liking. And then here, when representing sellers then this language is kind of similar here. It just uh, specifies the, you know, little more details. So, yep. So, and that is in the client sign here and sign here. And that concludes a agents, agency office policies. All right, we got through it. I know there was a lot to take in, uh, but going through that in advance will just help you give a, gr oh, 
a great understanding of all the paperwork that has to be signed and what it all means and the nuances all. And again, we had, you know, the listing agreement, the disclosures for property condition and let paint, MLS exemption form, authorization to release information, and then the brokerage disclosures, which were their affiliated business, agency policies, and wiring fraud.